More than anything else, the historical Dracula is known for his inhumane cruelty. Impalement was Dracula's preferred method of torture and execution. It was one of the most gruesome ways of dying imaginable. You see, Dracula usually had a horse attached to each of his victim's legs, and then a sharpened stake was gradually forced into your body. The end of the stake was usually oiled or sometimes red hot and care was taken that it wasn't too sharp, else the victim might die too rapidly from shock. Normally, the stake was inserted into the body through the buttocks, or if female, up the genitalia, and was often forced through the body until it emerged from your mouth. However, there were many instances where victims were impaled through other bodily orifices, upside down or through the abdomen or chest. The list of tortures employed by this cruel prince reads like an inventory of the devil's tools. Nails in heads, cutting off limbs, blinding, strangulation, burning, cutting off noses and ears, mutilation of genitals, scalping, skinning, and exposure to the elements or to wild animals, and boiling alive. No one was immune to Dracula's attentions. His victims included women and children, peasants and great lords, ambassadors from foreign powers and merchants. However, the vast majority of his victims came from the merchants and boyars of Transylvania and his own Wallachia. You see, Dracula's own father and older brother were murdered by unfaithful boyars, so they might have left an unsavory taste in his mouth that he needed to wash away. Many of the merchants in Transylvania and Wallachia were Saxons who were seen as parasites, preying upon the Romanian natives while the boyars had proven their disloyalty time and time again. Many have attempted to justify Dracula's actions on the basis of political necessity, while others said he derived a perverted pleasure from his actions. Dracula's atrocities against the people were usually attempts to enforce his own moral code upon the county. He appears to have been particularly concerned with female chastity. He also insisted that his people be honest and hardworking. Merchants who cheated their customers were likely to find themselves mounted on a stake beside common thieves too. In order to understand the life of Vlad Dracula, it's first necessary to understand something about the nature of Wallachian society and politics. Before Romania was Romania, it was two different principalities, Wallachia and Moldavia. The throne of Wallachia was hereditary, but not by the law of primogenitor. The boyars or great nobles had the right to elect voivode from among the various eligible members of the royal family. As a result, cousins murdered cousins for the throne and Wallachian politics tended to be bloody and unstable. The second fact of the 15th century political life was the influence of powerful neighbors. To the west, we have the very strong kingdom of Hungary, and to the south was the Ottoman Empire, and they would be seeing their golden age in about 100 years. So you can imagine how substantial they've grown, and the two powerhouses had a lot of tension. In the middle was Wallachia. Throughout the 14th and 15th centuries, the princes of Wallachia attempted to maintain a precarious independence, by constantly shifting alliances with these two powerful neighbors, usually by giving the rival ruler one of their children as collateral, or as history likes to call it, a hostage. Both Vlad and his father, we'll call him Vlad Sr., were hostages when young. Vlad Sr. was given as a hostage to the King of Hungary, which resulted in them becoming allies, and Hungary helped Vlad get the throne from his cousins. So, under the Hungarian king's watch, he was allowed to stay in Transylvania, a neighboring principality, to gather support. And this is where Vlad Dracula was born. Vlad Sr. was entered into the Order of the Dragon by his mentor, the Hungarian king, and became known as Vlad Dracul, or the Dragon. His sons would be called Dracula, or the sons of, hence his son became Vlad Dracula. In a nutshell, Vlad Sr. got his family thrown of Wallachia, but then a few years later, the old king of Hungary died and a new one was placed. Wallachia wanted to remain neutral as the new Hungarian king and the Ottoman sultan duked it out. Vengeful Hungary forced the Draculas to free Wallachia. Hungary put Vlad's cousin onto the throne instead, but with Turkish support, Vlad Sr. retook his throne but had to show loyalty by giving him two sons, one being Vlad Dracula. Later on after this, Dracula's father and older brother actually died, 
because they were betrayed by boyars who murdered them on the order of this new Hungarian king's military leader. This would lead to Vlad Dracula inheriting the throne, supported by the Ottomans. The rest of his life, he gains the throne and loses it, back and forth. He was a puppet to two larger, more powerful nations who yanked him to their side when they needed him. On the other hand, the Draculas wanted to remain neutral so much that they were easily flippable, and they flipped and flopped. Their loyalty was to surviving, and whichever side gave them that, that's where they ran to. Economist is not the first thing that comes to mind when one thinks of Vlad the Impaler, but being a cruel ruler doesn't exclude the possibility of being a smart one as well. The legend says that during Vlad the Impaler's reign, you could leave a purse with gold unattended in the marketplace, for everyone was afraid to steal it. Even though he impaled people and showed no sympathy, he rid Wallachia of people who pollute the land. Thieves were impaled, beggars, homeless, and the plague infested were burned alive. In Vlad the Impaler's own words, they depart earthly sufferings for a better afterlife. He further centralized his realm by building fortresses and expanding the capital. He undertook road construction to enhance domestic and international trade and gave subsidies to handymen to open their businesses. He even encouraged the middle class with partial tax exemptions. I'll leave you with two stories about Vlad that sums up his concerns. The burning of the sick and poor. Dracula was very concerned that all his subjects work and contribute to the common welfare. He once noticed that the poor, vagrants, beggars, and crippled had become very numerous in his land. Consequently, he issued an invitation to all the poor and sick in Wallachia to come to a party for a great feast, claiming that no one should go hungry in his land. As the poor and crippled arrived in the city, they were ushered into a great hall where a fabulous feast was prepared for them. The prince's guests ate and drank late into the night, and then Dracula himself made an appearance. He asked, What else do you desire? Do you want to be without cares, lacking nothing in this world? When they responded positively, Dracula ordered the hall boarded up and set on fire. No one escaped the flames. Dracula explained his actions to the boyars by claiming that he did this in order that they represent no further burden to other men so that no one will be poor in my realm. The Lazy Woman Dracula once noticed a man working in the field while wearing too short kaftan. The prince stopped and asked the man whether or not he had a wife. When the man answered in the affirmative, Dracula had the woman brought before him and asked her how she spent her days. The poor, frightened woman stated that she spent her days washing, baking, and sewing. The prince pointed out her husband's short kaftan as evidence of her laziness and dishonesty and ordered her impaled despite her husband's protest that he was satisfied with her work. Dracula then ordered another woman to marry the peasant, but admonished her to work hard or she would suffer her predecessor's fate. And that's just a little bit about Vlad Dracula. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to see more historical recreations, please consider subscribing to my channel. Each of your subscriptions does help this channel grow. It allows me to continue making more content for you. It's the best way to support me. Let me know in the comments who you'd like to see in real life. I do make a list of all your suggestions, and I will see you in the next one.